He has a plan. His prophet Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11, he said, I know the plans I have for you. And they're plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. God has a plan. But sometimes the challenge is for us to figure out how. How? How is my life going to make an impact? I want my life to make an impact. I've had this since I was a tiny child. But how? How, how am I going to make an impact? How many of you have ever wanted to know how to do something, whether it was to build something or, or a, you want to know how to cook something or you want to know how to make something or, or be able to do something you've never done before? And how many of you have ever accessed YouTube? You've ever accessed YouTube as your way to learn how to do it? Hands high in the air. You're not ashamed. You don't mind to let everybody know that, hey, yeah, yeah, I knew there was something out there that would teach me how. Hey, I want to, I want to tell you something that you may not know. Um, I think YouTube came into existence in most of our lifetimes in this room. It's not that long ago that YouTube came into existence, you think. But actually, whoever came up with YouTube, it wasn't original. There actually uh, was a YouTube thousands of years ago. You just, you just don't know about it until now. And I want you to know that God was the first YouTube inventor. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 14. I want you to know that God had a plan to help you with how, how, how am I going to make an impact? And he wanted to make sure you'd know how. He wanted to make it so simple for you that like on YouTube, I mean, how many of you would prefer, again with your hand, how many of you would prefer not to have to read the instruction manuals or all the words if you could just see the person do it like the YouTube model, that would make it so much, not only easier, you'd learn faster, right? How many of you, you'd prefer the YouTube model? If I handed you a big bunch of words, you'd choose, well, God knew us so well, he created us. And he knew the fastest way we learn and the more preferred way we learn would be if he would send us a YouTube model. John 1.14, the word became flesh. And he lived among us. He made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So many people want to know, so what's God like? Do you know that, that this YouTube model, God's intent was not only to help you know how to lead a high-impact life, He even wanted you to know what He's like. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3 tells us that Jesus, the Son of God, was the exact representation of God's being, sustaining all things through His powerful Word. That's Hebrews 1, Three, so, so God not only wanted us to know how to lead a high-impact life, He also wanted us to know that, hey, this is a representation of me. This is the best YouTube model for you to get acquainted with, look at, and follow. So much so that the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 12, verse 2, he said, fix your eyes on, let me hear you say it, the YouTube model, fix your eyes on, that's Hebrews 12 too. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the model to follow. And that's exactly what the early followers of Jesus did, but they also went, hey, we're going to make sure this YouTube model is findable for future generations. So they wrote in the scriptures what we've seen with our eyes, what we've touched with our hands, what, what they had heard. They said, we're going to make sure that they all get to see the YouTube that God sent from the heavens. Think about it. Jesus didn't come just to die for your sins. He came to show you how to lead a high-impact life. The way he showed a bunch of regular, ordinary people who would never have believed or imagined that their names could could, could be known thousands of years later because actually there aren't a lot of first century names that, that we would know other than these guys fixed their eyes on the YouTube model and they started learning from him. And the impact was extraordinary. They wanted us to know what they saw and also what they learned. And the first thing that they began to learn from the YouTube model, Jesus as they were following him, was, was that his plan, that he was 
showing them was not an upfront plan. In fact, they kept watching him. And, and his name was Emmanuel. Does anybody know what Emmanuel means? That was Emmanuel. They'd often refer to him as Emmanuel. What does Emmanuel mean? Everybody, what's, anybody who knows? God, God what? He, God with us. God with us. Hmm. Got up close. Not got up front, got up close. And, and everywhere they watched him, he wanted to get up close to people. Like, like they would ask him, where's the kingdom you're talking about? Where's this kingdom? And he said, oh, the kingdom of God. Watch my hand. The kingdom of God is at hand, eye to eye, heart to heart, life on life. Jesus sat at their tables with them. And the guys watched. The world watched. Like, he didn't seem to need a stage because he was modeling for them. The YouTube model was showing them. In fact, let, let me just ask right now, like, like some of you, um, I, I was up front a little bit ago, up, up there. But now I'm up close. Is this slightly more impactful? Yes. <laughs> They're saying, yes. <laughs> like some of you are even thinking, oh man, he's walking around the room. He's walking around the room. Like, like I even saw you tense up right here. Is he going to come near me? His feet were on the move. He was modeling a mobile ministry plan. His plan didn't require them to get to a building. He was getting to them. Up close. He sat at their tables with them. He sat at their tables with them. I mean, you, you really can't get a whole lot. Like, if you sit in the living room, you're over here. But if we're at the table, Malcolm, we're right here. We're just talking like this. Eye to eye, heart to heart. How many of you, the people who've had the greatest impact on your life, were people who got up close to your life? They were people not you watched from a distance. They were, they were people who, they were, they were with you. Emmanuel, God with us. He was teaching us. Now, hear this. He was teaching us. You may impress from a distance, but you impact up close. And you didn't say you wanted to lead an impressive life. You said you wanted to lead an impressive impactful life. And the first thing Jesus taught them as the YouTube model was, now for some of us, that's great relief because most of you, if I handed you the microphone right now, you go, what am I going to do with that? You know, how many of you public speaking isn't your favorite class? You know, like you were, you were like it's a bunch of us. They say that for some people, public speaking up front is a worse fear for them than death. They'd rather die than have to speak up front. Aren't you relieved? that he wasn't modeling an upfront plan. He didn't require you to, the only way you could impact was to be on a stage. No, these guys watched. You may impress from a distance, but you impact up close. And all of you in this room know that the closer we get, the closer my feet are to yours, is it not true the higher the impact rate? I mean, these guys are dead still right now. <laughs> and that's what was happening for people. You need to know when you sit in a coffee shop with somebody, when you sit in a cafeteria with somebody, when you slow down on your deck or on your patio with somebody and your feet are near them, guess who's housed in you? You learned this as a child. Where does Jesus live? He lives in my... Guess who just got up close to them? That was his original model. And he's helping you know that the first thing you want to learn by fixing your eyes on the YouTube model is his, his plan was an up-close plan. It's worth notating, up-close, up-close. Where is my life going to make an impact? You said you wanted to make an impact. Jesus, the YouTube model would say, up-close, watch me. And we'd watch him. Nobody wanted to get near the leper, but Jesus' feet started moving across the street. They all moved away, but Jesus moved toward. He moved so close, watch my hand, that he touched the leper. The woman who was sitting there alone had been there alone many times until Jesus shows up at her favorite beverage stop. And it wasn't over non-bottled spring water that Jesus got up 
close to her. It was just at the watering well where she came for a beverage. And Jesus up close profoundly impacted not only her, but up close, let me tell you where, where. Because these guys, some of these guys, like the first words out of Peter's mouth when Jesus met him, first day, Jesus met Peter, by the way, at his workplace. Peter didn't come to the synagogue because he didn't attend the synagogue, as far as we know, because the first words out of his mouth, the first day they met at Peter's workplace, Jesus helped him on his boat because that's what Jesus, or Peter did for a living. And after this cool thing happens where Jesus is up close with him on his boat, you need to know when you go do things with people, don't set that apart as well then, you know, I wish I could get them to church. Hey, what? Jesus is housed in you. You're up close to them. If you're in their boat, you're skateboarding with them. You're riding bikes with them. You're at the gym with them. You're working beside them. Everywhere you're up close, there's opportunity. And Peter's got some new guy on his boat. And suddenly he feels the presence of God and out of his mouth just comes the utter truth. And Peter said, I'm a sinner. And Jesus didn't say, well, get your act together. You should be going to the synagogue. No, he said, hey, why don't we hang out together? And I'll teach you how to lead a high impact life. Where do you learn that up close? It was an up close ministry plan and it was happening in the main streams. That's the second thing you want to write down if you're a note taker. Jesus modeled, his YouTube model was teaching up close, mainstream. What do I mean by mainstream? Well, that was at Peter's workplace, but others would tell you that they met him in mainstream locations. Most of them, when you read read the account, they weren't meeting him in a building. They were meeting him where they did life, where they did work. He's qualifying for you that, that ministry territory is everywhere. You've seen the phrase on some of our stuff, every day, everywhere. Mainstream, that means that probably Jesus was impacting lives long before we have him in public ministry because Jesus had a mainstream vocation. Anybody know what his mainstream vocation was? Like, you don't know him as the president of the synagogue or the the, the leading elder. You know him as what? Jesus was a what? Jesus was a carpenter, a builder. So when people met him, they didn't freak out. Let me tell you. Like, how many pastors in the room? Pastors in the room? Pastor, one, two, three, four, four. There's a bunch of us. So you all all just tell me if I'm wrong. You can yell out, wrong. So we're in a social situation, and people are just letting it fly. And then all of a sudden, somebody walks over and says, hey, reverend. And all of a sudden, the people you were with who were acting themselves suddenly are going, Oh, oh, uh, you're a reverend? Are you a real one? Like, uh, um, excuse me, I, like, I don't usually tell jokes like that. And I'm, man, I'm really, my grandmother's religious. And, 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 and I've gone with her like at Easter. And uh, uh, reverend, nice to, me, nice, nice to meet you. I'm Joe, Joe, I've been looking, I'm sorry, I've been looking for Joe all night. Nice to meet you. And you're, they're running to the other side of the room. Why? Because you see them sweating bullets. Why? Because you're the reverend? They're not comfortable with you. They're, how many of you have ever, I mean, pastors, come on, is that not true? They get nervous, or, nervous around us because in their head they're thinking I need to be somebody I'm not so so Jesus the the son of God savior of mankind not only shows up as a carpenter oh so where oh I'm from Nazareth where's that at oh it's a small little town oh oh yeah anything good come from Nazareth I mean he was not he was not out to intimidate people or help them know how important he was because he wanted to be up close in the mainstreams And he wanted to build a kingdom. And think about it. Every one he chose at the beginning had mainstream vocations, jobs. None of them were leading rabbis at local synagogues. None of them had been through rabbi training school. They were all regular people who he just knew if he had them up close and they watched the YouTube model, they'd figure it out. And they'd know that everywhere their feet went, In the mainstreams of life, there was going to be kingdom advance opportunity every day, everywhere, mainstreams. Everywhere you go, that, oh, Dwight, that sounds like 24 7. I could be making impact. Like, that sounds like I don't have to plan a service. Like, like I'm the walking mobile ministry plan? Yes. 
Yes, that's what they were learning because all the stories you read that you love, you love these stories, they were happening every day, everywhere, and it was like there wasn't one sort of place or way it had to happen. It was happening in the mainstreams everywhere. Mm. Wow. Sounds like he was an equal opportunity employer. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Up close, mainstreams. Oh, one of the other things that they told us that they learned, because they, they put one story after another after another of just one life. You'd think, I mean, he's here to change the world. But it seems like he focuses on the one life that's in front of him in the moment. You heard this week that I was nicknamed as a child Dwight the Fright. What that means is that I left an energy trail that wasn't all that great. Um, and I was difficult to be around. Maybe I still am, but, but I was especially difficult. And so my parents deserved a break every now and then from Dwight the Fright. My sister's sitting here, and, and she would say, yeah, I kind of deserved a break too. And occasionally the family got one. I'd be dropped off single-handedly at Grandma's. And Grandma always had a plan for my energy. And, and on one occasion, I got through the front door, and she just, you know, she just started focusing my energy immediately. She reached up in her closet, and she pulled down a great big tin of dominoes, and she dumped them out all over the dot. She had a massive dining room table and just hundreds of dominoes went flying. You know what a domino is? Everybody know what a domino is? They, they kind of look like this. It was a, it just a, a, an array of dominoes. And then we'd start lining them up near each other, up close to each other, one after another after another. How many of you ever lined up dominoes? Come on, hands up. You, oh, wow, it's almost 100%. We've lined up dominoes. So, so it, it's a little tricky because you know that, that you don't want anything to happen prematurely. So, so eventually, like, I'm so focused, and, and I'm creating little whys, and I'm creating circles. and I'm, You know, she got a big dining room table. And like, there's hundreds of here. So, so I'm real focused, so focused. She's off in the kitchen now baking cookies. I don't even realize she's left the room until I've got the last domino in place. And she's nowhere to be found. And I, Grandma, wait, wait, walk slow. Because she lived in one of those old houses that moved, you know, when you, when you walk. And I didn't want any of this to happen before she got there. Walk slow. She got in there and she got right beside me. And then I went to touch that domino and she, she grabbed my arm and pulled it back and said, Grandson, don't touch that yet. Grandson, I want you to pretend. Now, this, this is before the... the the Disney movie, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. So she's like way ahead of her time. She said, I want you to pretend you're so small that all you can see is one domino. You think it's just one. But grandson, never forget, when you impact that one just right, it'll impact another. That will impact another. That will impact another. That will impact another. And you don't have to worry about number 23 or 57 or 109 or 356. You just worry about the one life that's in front of you and let the domino ripple effect take place. They watched it time and again with Jesus. He'd focus on this one life. And the next thing you know, you'd see a whole bunch of people being impacted. So what you're starting to notice is, this YouTube model, it's, it's like kind of doable because most of you wouldn't be comfortable standing in front of a crowd, but you could do one-on-one -on -one with somebody. That wouldn't be too complicated. It was an up-close, mainstream, one-life-at-a-time plan he was teaching. Hmm. If that's what he was modeling, what were his methods? When, when we look at him like the YouTube model, what were his methods? Well, I... I I'll, I'll tell you one of his methods. In fact, Matthew, if you turn to Matthew chapter 9, you'll, you'll see it too. But, but I, I, uh, some of you, you're just, you're, you know, it's kind of hard to juggle the Bible and juggle your notes and everything else. And you're getting this because you want your life to make an impact. And that's kind of smart. I think you do want to do that. So here's what I want you to know is uh, take your hands, put them in front of your eyes like they're blinders. And, and I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I want you to say the word see and pull your hands away. Okay, one, two, three. C, what Matthew wants you to know in Matthew chapter 9, verse 9, because in verses 1 through 8, he's kind of telling you that, you know, Jesus showed up in Jesus' hometown. Like, where do you start living out this up-close mainstream one life at a time? You start in your own hometown. You start where you're from. You start in your school, your workplace, your neighborhood. 
So Jesus is validated through Matthew's account in verses 1 through 8 that he started in his own hometown. He touches one life and domino ripple effect by the time you get to verse 8. Verse 9. Verse 9. Matthew now wants to tell you his story because he's one life and not everybody is too crazy about him. In fact, most people try to walk the other side of the street or stay away from him. He's a co-conspirator with the Roman government. Nobody wants to hang out with him. He's collecting taxes. I mean, he kind of, he's kind of this dude that works for IRS collecting taxes, and, and, and most people are trying to avoid uh, giving up their money. It says in verse 9, as Jesus went on from there, he what? He saw What's it mean as Jesus went on from there? That means like you're going from Walmart, you got one more run to, to Walgreen, and, and, and Jesus is going on from there. Most of ministry happens along the way. Most of the stories that you will read about Jesus, it was as Jesus went on from there. Along the way, Jesus, it it's, it's almost feels like ministry isn't planned or scheduled. It's serendipitous. It's just seeing people along the way. Matthew wants you to know as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man. Named Matthew. He saw a man named Matthew. Now, you don't think that's a big deal. Let me tell you how big a deal it is. I know after our son started going to a new school, I asked him one night, he was a little guy, grade school, and I said, Son, how's it going at your new school? He said, Dad, thanks for asking. I'm invisible. I said, What? He said, Dad, I'm invisible. He said, What? I looked at my wife like, like honey, what, what, what's he talking about? And she looked at me confused, and I thought, oh, man, he's watched too many superhero flicks, and, and he thinks he's invisible man now, and he's going to you know, walk through. And I thought, oh, he's going to hurt himself. So, so I said, son, look back at me. Look back at me, son. Um, look at me. Look at me, son. I see you. <laughs> You're not invisible. He said, Dad, I know you see me. But at this new school... I go out for recess, and they're all looking for each other, Dad. They know each other. So say they, they're, looking, they're looking for each other because they went to school together last year, but nobody knows me. So they're looking at the, Dad, nobody sees me. And then I get to the cafeteria, and I get my tray, and I'm walking in, Dad. And, and everybody's walking all around me, Dad, like, like they're all looking for each other. And, Dad, I sit there, and I'm, I'm just kind of seeing, but, Dad, nobody sees me. And then after school, I, I, I've not only sat alone through lunch, but I'm waiting for Mom, and it takes her 13 minutes to come and get me, and, Dad... Dad, 13 minutes is a long time, Dad, because they're all walking all around me, Dad. Everybody's walking around me. Dad, there's everybody and nobody sees me, Dad. I'm invisible. I'm invisible, Dad. I'm invisible. At this point, my son is sitting there sobbing and my heart is breaking. I'm his father. And my son feels invisible. Do you know how many people feel that way every day? She actually has been your clerk at the checkout counter at Walmart before. Do you see her? Her name's Ashley. She's got two sick kids at home. She's a single mom, and she didn't want to come to work today. She's terrified. She's calling every break, checking on her kids. Do you, do you see her? Her name is Ashley. Matthew wants you to know as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named, named Matthew. Will you see her name? We were in a new restaurant, and we were on the opposite side of Denver. We, are, we live on the far east side, and we were on the far west side. And it was a Red Robin. Anybody been to a Red Robin restaurant? So we get in this restaurant, and I, I used to serve tables when I was a young kid, and, and I know about how many tables a server ought to have. And, and he's got 20 tables. I've counted. I've watched him. He hasn't gotten to our table yet, but I'm counting all his tables. I thought, that's way too many to keep track of. So by the time he gets to our table, he's literally sweating. Uh, he's got so much to do. And I said, John, are you okay? And he said, Dude, do I know you? And I said, well, I don't know, John. I don't, I, don't, I, I don't think so, but I've been watching you. It looks like you have 20 tables. Yeah, somebody didn't show up for work tonight. And da, 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 da. I said, so, John, are you okay? He said, dude, like, you're freaking me out. Like, why, why are you calling me John? Like, somebody set you up. Like, did somebody tell you, like, like, like or, oh, I, it's a common name. You were just kind of like, you just picked the most common one because that actually is my name. How'd you know my name? I hardly did, wanted to tell him, you know, but I... I hit his chest, and I said, John, you're wearing it. And he looked down and went, oh. Why had John forgotten he was wearing his name? I'll tell you why. Nobody sees John. He's just the waiter. As Matthew, his whole life had been the tax collector. Ashley's just the checkout clerk at Walmart. No, 
Matthew wants to know, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. By the end of the night, John not only had a name, he told us his whole life story. And we went to leave the restaurant, and he said, you're, now you're going to come back and see me, right? And I said, well, we live, we live clear on the other side of the city. He said, yeah, but you're going to come back and see me, right? He was, he was pretty sure we'd started a relationship. And we had. It just started with C. See, you need to know that what he modeled up close mainstream one life at a time. Then they started recognizing he had a method, and his method was to see the people others weren't seeing. Do you know in Africa, there's one tribe, when they're walking toward the other one, they'll say, I see you. And the one walking toward them will say, I am here. And it's the gift of presence. I see you. High value. Jesus would see people. I want to make sure you know that because you're going to go out and live this, if you and I are going to be Jesus labors. Together. We can do this. This is a way you're going to remember this. If you and I are going to lead high impact lives, we're going to what? One, two, three. We're going to see. Again, we're going to one, two, three, see. Oh, and now put your hands up since you've got them free. I want you to look like a patrol guard, like you're going to save all the kindergarten children because the traffic's coming, you know. So you're going to stop. This is your stop position. You're going you're to have to, if your Jesus followers recognize that the YouTube model showed you how to see and Stop. Oh, man, you're so fast. You're saying it already. If you and I are Jesus followers, we're going to see and stop. You're fast learners. What does that look like? What does it look like? Well, well, Jesus will tell you the story, man. He, he, he told some of them when he was trying to describe what a, what, a, what a good Samaritan was or a kingdom laborer. He said there, there, there was a religious dude, and he was a priest, and he was walking down the road, and he saw this guy had been beat up and robbed. He saw him, but he kept on walking. This is in Luke 10, by the way. Jesus tells this story for them to understand that you can't just see. He said, then, then a Levite's walking down, and, and, and he sees the dude all beat up and robbed. And he sees him, and Jesus told this story, and, and the Levite walked on. And then he picked the most unlikely candidate ever that none of them would have believed was worth any value, let alone could have an impact, a Samaritan. They called them dogs. And he said, but the good Samaritan, when he saw the man, he, let me hear you, he stopped. That's where high impact happens. High impact happens when you see and stop. It, it may not really rearrange your schedule a ton. Jesus stopped with people. People not only were not invisible with Jesus, Jesus stopped with people. You love these stories. I mean, Jesus is walking down the road, and, 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 and he sees this guy up in a tree. He's a, he's a short little dude. He's, he'd be kind of like a, of our time, Danny DeVito. You know, he's so short, and, he, and he's got lots of money. The guy's wealthy, and everybody kind of knows who he is. And he can't see, you know. He, he can't see. So, so he climbs up a tree so he can see. His name's Zacchaeus. And, and Jesus sees him up in the tree, and Jesus stopped and said, hey, get out of the tree. Why? Because Jesus wanted to spend time with him. He wanted to spend time with him. High impact happens not only when you see and when you stop, but when you spend time with. Let's do it together. You and I are not only, if we're Jesus followers, we're learning his method. We're looking at this YouTube model. And he taught us not only to see and to stop, but to spend time with. Spend time with. It was one day Jesus was walking down the road, and the disciples who were watching the YouTube model, learning how to lead high-impact lives, there were so many people around, and, and Jesus stopped. He stopped and said, who touched me? Somebody touched me. And the disciples were almost like, like, Lord, there's a whole lot of people around. They're all pushing, shoving, brushing up. You want to know who touched you? He said, no, no, no. Somebody touched me. Who touched me? Who touched me? Jesus had stopped moving. And from out among the crowd, a woman who'd been sick for 12 years, because she saw him going and she... She, she just wasn't in his sight line. So she reached in from behind and she pushed and she got finally to where her arm could reach and she reached out and touched him. And that's when he stopped and said, who touched me? 
And when she came out and he saw who she was and she said, it was me. He spent time. Because sometimes when you spend time, that's when a person begins to feel like they have worth, value. And he gave her the gift of dignity. And he said, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Jim Elliott used to say, wherever you are, be all there in that moment. Do you know how you spell love? You spell love T-I-M-E. You know that's true. You know that's true. And Jesus modeled that most people would never feel loved if you see, stop, and you never spend time with. We have a piano in our home. I happen to play keyboard. I pound a lot and play a lot. And, and eventually it gets out of tune. We have a piano tuner who we had to change because the other guy retired and got this young guy in his 20s with purple hair. And uh, he was scheduled to come in for a tuning last month. And uh, I was out mowing the lawn. And, and I'm mowing the lawn and my wife comes running out. To, I got you know, big headset on because I'm listening to great music while I'm mowing, you know. And, and then my wife comes up behind me, spooks me. And, what? She said, the, the piano tuner, he's done, and he, he wants you to hear whether, whether it's good. And I said, well, I, I'm sure it's good. He does a good job. No, no, he really wants you to come in and check it out. <sighs> okay. Turned the mower off, went in the house, and sat down. And Man, Joe, this is awesome. Thank you. I turn around. And whew, because I saw him at this point, he was frozen right behind me. And he did not look like the Joe that has come to our house before. I said, are, are you okay? I said, no, no, I'm not okay. This young guy with purple hair standing in my living room, I can tell he's starting to get emotional. He said, my wife, four years into marriage and she's, She's gotten an affair and she's left me and I don't know what to do. And I'm, She's filed for divorce. At this point, I knew I needed to just not see and stop. I needed to spend time and I got off the bench and turned around and I said, Joe, uh, I'm standing there sweating from mowing. I'm a stinky mess and, and I'm a regular guy. He doesn't know what I do for a living. He just knows we're one of those people that have a keyboard to tune. I said, Joe, Man, I'm so sorry. Uh, Joe, you're not alone. I said, well, I, I mean, I'm standing here, but I, I just need you to know there have been times in my life when things really got bad, and that was early in my life, and still I have these moments. And there's a God who cares a lot about you, and we're with him right now, and you're not alone. You're not alone in this. You're not alone. I'm here to tell you you're not alone. He's right here. Joe, I'm going to be praying for you, um, but would, you, would it like freak you out if I just, I don't know, would you be comfortable if I prayed out loud with you right now here? He said, no, dude, that, that, that's totally, like what do I do? I don't know what to do. I said, you don't do anything. You just stand there and I'll just pray. I prayed a short prayer for Joe and when I finished, he was standing there crying. I'm looking at this guy crying with the purple hair, and I'm like, I don't even know you. And I felt like God was just saying, what would a dad do in this moment? You know, what would a Jesus father do in this moment? I thought, man, if this was my boy. So I felt so awkward because this is a total stranger, but I just gave him a hug. And as I was coming out of the hug, this broken guy with purple hair said, hey, could we have coffee or, or a meal or something? I said, absolutely. Because I know the plan. I learned it from the YouTube model. You don't just see, you don't just stop, you spend time with. And for the last four weeks, Joe and I have been meeting together, eating together, sharing together, texting together. Even as recent as yesterday and again last night. You just need to know that's what Jesus YouTubed modeled for you. He wanted you to know it's doable. It's doable. If you understand 
that up close in the mainstream of life, one life at a time, you're willing to, come on, let's do it together, because nobody will ever believe you were with Forge if you can't do this. <laughs> Is that not true? If you're Jesus' follower and you want to lead a high-impact life, you're going to see, stop, and spend time with. You're going to do what? You're going to see, stop, spend time with. It was really everything Jesus was modeling, even in Matthew 22. When you look at Matthew 22 and an expert in the law asked Jesus, what matters most? What matters most? Put your right hand in the air as high as you can get it. Is that as high as you? That's, that's it. Okay, that's as high as you can get it. But Alexis just got her hand higher. Okay, okay. So these guys have been with me before. Have a seat. I just want you to know that for a moment, most of you looked around to see how high everybody else's hand, and that was probably okay. When Jesus said, there's two things that matter. The first one in Matthew 22 was, love the Lord your God with all your everything. How much is that? Well, the question is, not could you raise your hand. Could you love him a little bit more? Could you love him a little bit more? Could you love him a little bit more? That's always the question in my life. Can I love you a little bit more? Can I love you? What if that makes me look ridiculous? I don't care. Jesus said that's the most important thing, to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm going to let, can I love you a little bit more? Can I, what if I look ridiculous? It doesn't matter. Can I love you? Listen, I live for an audience of one, and it's him. Can I love you a little bit more? The greatest gift you're going to give this world is your intimacy with God, because as great as you are, and I like you a lot, the world doesn't need us, they need him, but the more we've been with him, the more he shows up. Everywhere our feet show up. Now put your, right, your uh, other hand out horizontally. Um, so, so the other hand, you had one hand up. Now you're putting your right hand out horizontally. That person that your hand is nearest is your current neighbor. Jesus said, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So, so the person near you, but can I tell you what's going to happen? Your feet are going to move in about two hours, and you're going to have a different neighbor. And tomorrow morning, when you show up to breakfast, you're going to have a different neighbor. When you get home in the afternoon, you're probably going to have a different neighbor. Every time your feet move, there's new opportunity to see, stop, spend time with. Because your neighbor changes. That's not your geographical address neighbor. Because Jesus didn't have a geographical address. Everywhere his feet went, that's the person to love. That's the person in the moment. I'd just come back from a trip, Washington, D.C., I was so tired, and my wife, Dawn, I love you, honey, so much. She, she said, honey, why don't you just go sit in the easy chair, and I'll get you some iced tea. I was so dog tired, and I got it. We have a chair that, you know, it'll lean back. And so I'm almost, I'm almost totally reclined. And, and then, oh, that's when I saw it. I looked up on my roof, and my ceiling had a water spot on it, like a big water spot. And it, we had never had that before. I yelled, like, what, what in the world? Honey, honey. Come here. What is this? I'd been gone for a week. She said, oh, we had a terrible storm while you were gone. We must have a leak in the roof. And I said, whoa, whoa. She said, honey, there's another storm. The app says there's another storm coming in tonight, like a bad one. I said, well, then we're going to have to get it fixed. I'm thinking, yeah, I hope we can get it fixed in one day like that. I don't know if that's going to happen. I make a bunch of calls. By my seventh call, the guy that answered said, hello, this is James Arufer. Can I help you? I said, well, hello, James Arufer. Yes, you maybe could help me. I need to know. I like... Can you, I need a roofing issue. I, I, I've got a leak. I, clearly, I've got a spot on my ceiling that was never there before. Um, I need somebody who can come today. I need somebody who's affordable. Are you affordable? And, and actually, do you have insurance if you fell off my roof? Um, and, 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 and are you trustworthy? Are you honest? He said, I, yeah, sir, I think I'm all those things. Well, where do you live? And I said, well, I live on the east side. And he said, sir, I actually have an appointment this morning on the east side. Like, I could probably be at your house by 4 o'clock and with... You know, the daylight, I, I don't know, I could at least get up and take a look at it, maybe repair it. I said, we're on. So I went back to my easy chair, and 3.58, the doorbell rang. Doorbell rings. I go to the door. Have you ever talked to somebody on the phone, and, and you have a visual image of what you think they were going to look like? I open the door, and it's like a regular guy. Like, he's got holes all over through his jeans and his T-shirt. He's got a bandana around his head, a big, rugged-looking guy, and he said... And this is what helped me know it was the real guy. He said, hello, I'm James Arufer. I'm here to fix your roof, sir. And I said, well, James, man, come on in. And this regular-looking guy comes in, 
looks up, says he'll climb up on the roof, comes back down, gives me a quote. It's a fair quote. And I said, man, we're on. So he gets back up on my roof and he's working on it. I'm back in my easy chair when the doorbell rings again. And it's not a half an hour, an hour and a half later. It's 45 minutes later. He's at my door. And I thought, oh, shoot, something's wrong. He said, sir, nothing's wrong. It's totally fixed. I said, you told me it was going to take an hour and a half. He said, no, sir. I, I, it wasn't as complicated as I thought. I got it done in 45 minutes. And, and, uh, and, and it's totally fixed. If it ever gives you trouble, you tell me and I'll be back for free. It's, it's fixed permanently. Man. He said, oh, and, and sir, I've adjusted your bill. No, no, you haven't. You've done what? He said, I've adjusted your bill, sir. Now, every, most of us who pay bills, we know what happens when they adjust a bill. It goes usually one direction. And he said, yes, sir, here it is. And I, I looked at it, and it was half the price he'd originally quoted me. It was half. I said, hey, the, James, this is not what you told me it was going to cost. This is less. He said, yes, yeah, but, sir, it took me less materials and less time. This is the fair price. Now I really like this guy. So, so I go to get my checkbook, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give him the original amount. I'm just so happy it's fixed, and, the, man, I'm loving this guy. And I get back, and I hear him taking a call. Hello, this is James the Roofer. How can I help you? I thought, that's exactly the way he, he answered his phone when I called him. When he hung up, I said, James, man, you're doing such a great job with your, your one-man business. And, and, and uh, man, good job. And, and here's a check for all of it. And he said, sir, listen, I, I, I cannot accept your compliment. I thought, oh, I, that's weird. I, I don't think he understood what I just said. So I said, no, no, James, listen, I, I didn't know how I was going to get my roof fixed today, and I didn't know if I was going to find an affordable price. And, man, you came and delivered all of that and more. And, and man, I, listen, I'm just so happy. I found you. You're doing a great job. But I patted him on the shoulder again. He said, sir, I'm not kidding. I can't accept your compliment. Uh, anybody confused by this statement right now? Because I was, like, totally confused. Like, who, who does this? And I said, James, I, I'm, I don't understand. He said, well, sir, I, I, don't, I don't know you, but if you have just a minute, could I explain why? I said, totally, explain. He said, well, sir, um, 13 years ago, you would not have wanted me near your house or near your wife or near your children. 13 years ago, I was strung out on drugs, and my life was a mess. And then, I don't know, sir, I don't know anything about you, so I don't, I don't know if you're going to understand what I'm about to tell you, but I'm going I'm to try to make it real simple. Like, so, sir... Um, I found out 13 years ago that the, the God who made the entire universe, like he had a son, and his name was Jesus, and he came to build a relationship possibility for us with God to forgive us of our sins. And he's going through this whole thing, and I'm thinking, oh, my word, I'm, I'm looking around, like I'm wondering if there's a religious plaque, anything in my house, there's nothing. And I'm thinking, he does not know who I am. And so he goes through the whole thing, and then he gets done, and he says, so... So, sir, the reason I couldn't accept the compliment is not at least until I told you that I am who I am because of him. And I said, James, brother. He said, what? I said, brother. He said, you're one? <laughs> and I, I said, well, you don't need to act so surprised. Like, yes, I am one. Oh, oh. Ah, oh, no. like he's, he's starting to like, ah, uh, and I said, whoa, what's wrong? What's wrong? He said, shoot, man, if, if you already are one, what am I doing at your house? And I said, I don't know. I need my roof fixed. I'm not, I'm not sure I understand what's going on here. He said, no, I pray every day that, that God will send me where there aren't people who've ever heard or don't know. So if you already know, why am I at your house fixing your roof? He's like almost upset. And I said, well, James, because, I don't know. I, I, I needed my roof fixed, and I'm really happy, and I'm sorry that I'm disappointing you. But, but listen, by this time, my wife and kids are in the room. They're trying to figure out what all the loud noise is about. And I'm telling them, and, and then I said, James, man, give me business cards. I know a whole bunch of people. I want them to have you as a room. What you just do with me, I want, get all my neighborhood. I'm going to pass these out through my neighborhood. Like, I want everybody to have. He said, man, dude, like, I, all over this city I go. And, and you know, one time I was, I was up on a house, and, and I heard a gunshot down below, and I scrambled off the roof. And I, I, as I got down there, I, uh, the door was flying open. They were screaming for 911. There's a guy bleeding out on the floor. I knew he wasn't going to make it. Like, I was in the military years ago, and he said, I get down on my knees. 
I walked through the door and I said, listen, I, I'm, I'm here. I, I was up on the roof. I'm the, I'm the roofer. Uh, but, but, but I just want you to know, if you can hear me, blink your eyes. He said, the dude blinked his eyes. I said, listen, listen, I, God loves you. That's why I'm here. God loves you. He wants you to know that, that, like, there, that Jesus died on the cross. He said, I talked as fast as I could, but as clear as I could. I said, Jesus wants to forgive your sins. If you want Jesus to forgive your sins, just blink your eyes right now. And he said, the guy blinked his eyes. He said, I wasn't there when he died, but I know when I get to heaven, nobody can tell me I'm not going to meet that guy because a stupid, rugged roofer like me was on the job that day. He said, I've had amazing opportunities. So by this time, I just said, hey, would, could we pray over you and your ministry? He said, what? He said, could, could my wife and kids and I, could we pray over you and your ministry? What do you mean? He said, well, you guys, come on, you guys have all seen this where somebody is going to do something in ministry and you put your hands on them and you pray a blessing on them, you know? So how many of you have seen that done before? You know, somebody's going to go on a short-term mission trip or, you know, somebody's going to be the new leader at the church or whatever. And I said, we, we'd just like to pray a blessing on your ministry. So we gathered around our little family of four and we put our hands on this rugged roofer. And while we were praying, my son starts pulling on my arm. He thinks I don't know what's going on because my hand is on James's back as we're praying. And I do know what's going on because I can feel him just sobbing, sobbing. And the next thing I know, there's a pool of tears on my hardwood floor. And when we finish praying, James, the rugged roofer, has been crying so hard, he turns his back to my family, pulls his bandana out of his back pocket. And he turned to me and said, sir, I'm sorry I lost it like that in front of your family. But sir, I've been doing this for 13 years. And no one has ever validated my ministry before now. Why is that? Because somehow we've, we've gotten lost. We lost track of the original YouTube model. We think ministry is something that's done in certain places, at certain times, by certain people, in prescribed ways. When did we lose track of? When did we become so preoccupied with our modern methods that we lost track of the original plan? The YouTube model. It taught us that up close in the mainstreams, one life at a time, when we just see and stop and spend time with, we become the answer to Jesus' prayer. I close with this. Matthew 9, turn there quickly. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus, this is the same chapter where Matthew was telling you his story and Matthew tells you in his story that Jesus not only saw him and learned his name Matthew, but that Jesus eventually gets up close with Matthew at his house at a meal table and with Matthew's friends. And every time you look, he's with a worried dad. He's with a sick daughter. He's with two other people. And by the time you get to verse 35, he's been with Eight different people, individual people, one-on-one. -on -one. And then as Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, man, there's opportunity everywhere. The harvest is plentiful. But the labors are few. Look at me. Who's a labor? Watch me. Watch me. Somebody who loves God with everything in them and loves the person near them in the moment, sees them, stops with them, spends time with them, up close. A labor. Jesus said there need to be more of these. And he turned to his disciples and said, opportunities everywhere. The harvest is plentiful, but the labors are few. Forge exists for there to be more kingdom labors. And Jesus, the equal opportunity employer, showed us that everybody can be one. Heads bowed, eyes closed for a moment. I just want to ask you, this is a pretty simple, doable plan, isn't it? Like how many of you would say this is pretty doable? Pretty doable. Yeah. And laborers who love God and love others, they're going to get things done. They're not going to see and stop. I mean, they're not going to just see, they're going to stop and they're also going to spend time. They're going to make an impact. Laborers get things done. How many of you would want Jesus, who you've been worshiping, loving, 
to know you would love to be with him. And, and, and just wherever he sees, you'd like to see too. Wherever he'd like to stop, you'd like to, because he's housed in you, you'd like to stop there too. Wherever he's wanting to spend time up close with somebody, whether it's a neighbor kid in your neighborhood or whether it's a perfect stranger that's in line with you, you want to you wanna be his everyday, everywhere kingdom labor, advancing his desire for them to feel the love of God up close in the mainstreams, one life at a time. If that's you and you want Jesus to know you're in, that's the life you want to live. The YouTube model's clear, and I would tell you, if you're going to make the decision in just one minute, I would tell you then you keep reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and watch Jesus again and again and again be your YouTube model to learn from. Watch him. Get to know him. See where and how he was modeling his method for you and live it. How many of you don't want to just know this? You want to do it. You want to do it. If that's you, stand to your feet. I want to be his kingdom labor. I want to be his kingdom labor. Stand up. If that's you, you don't, don't stand if you don't think you do. But, but if you want to lead a high-impact life, this is the way. Jesus gave us the YouTube model, and this actually is the way to lead a high-impact life. Now, if you're standing, and this is what you want to do, you want to be a lifelong kingdom labor who's going to do these things Jesus modeled, and uh, then I'm going to ask you, look around the room. You see how many of us there are? I mean, this is super exciting to me. This is a lot because the domino ripple effect, you get in front of one life and you begin to impact them, they'll impact another. And it's, it's going to be massive. But let me ask you, I'm looking at you. Are we, is, is this as many labors as the Lord of the harvest deserves to have? He, he deserves to have more, more kingdom labors. So, Lord, show us how, how to multiply more. All I did with you just now is I shared with you a little bit of here's what a labor is. Have a seat. Nick, if there need to be more, what does that look like? Like how, how could we, we follow Jesus as a YouTube model and, and how, could we, how could we see more come? Right. Don't worry, I'm not preaching. I'm the application for tonight. Dwight just gave you the word that God wanted you to hear tonight. And I want to bring it home, okay? Simply put, what he just preached, he's lived out his whole life. Many of you are sitting here right now and saying, that's good and all fine. But I already know what many of you are already thinking. You don't know my story. You don't know what I'm going through. You don't know my challenges. If I didn't have all those, I could do what you said. I'm just trying to survive. You see, I was many of these uh, students' age when I heard this guy preach many, many years ago. And I didn't even know who Jesus was 40 years ago. Isn't that crazy? He looks too young to be 40 years ago. I know I look too young. <laughs> Nonetheless, Dwight, stand up. Carrie, stand up. Two more, uh, two men who've known each other 40 plus years. And I've known 40 plus years. And way, way different how they do their personalities, how they interact with God. But they both saw something. Everything that he just said when I was your age, they both stopped, saw me, and spent time with me when no one else would do. You can have a seat. The beautiful thing about that was two days before I saw both of them, I was so drunk, I couldn't tell you what I was up to. I was flunking out of high school. I stuttered. I was somebody that everybody thought in my town would never amount to anything. I was back in the day called a street kid. And all I wanted was somebody to see me, value me, and love me. Nobody saw that. Nobody believed that. And what was so amazing is that I sat just like in this situation, and they introduced me to somebody named Jesus. And from there, everything else took off. So, for example, the guy who destroys the English language to this day, I'm 55 years old. Also, Azerbaijan, Jadanish, Ayerlam, Hergun, Man, Danish, Magister, Amma, Sees, Hetchna, Basha, Dushmanam. I go to another country and learn a language to share with people who have never heard of Jesus once. These two men 
their fingerprints, their lives, although they never lived there, they believed and they saw and they looked in somebody that nobody else said could ever amount to anything. And here's what I know in the world in which we live today, most of you are thinking the exact same way. Pause for a second. I feel this heaviness for you, and I don't know why. Students, what you're feeling right now is not of God. He wants your life to count. And I want you to be seen, and I want you to be valued. And it's simply the model of Jesus. And you don't have to have a diploma. You don't have to have a degree. He wants to free you up today. You see the difference in the next few moments. From all the other camps that we do, it's all about what you've received. Did we serve you well? Did you have a great experience? Are you motivated? Are you inspired? And all those things are good and fine. But what we don't do is say, now this is what you are to do. You see, he and I stood, sit in a restaurant in Marion, Indiana in 1983 at a steakhouse called Mr. Steak, which no longer exists on the bypass. And I was so excited about Jesus. I wasn't raised in the church. I knew nothing about the Bible. Zero. Zilto. All I knew is something had happened in my life. Incredibly. And I wanted to share with other people. And there was this kid named Rod Kelly who came to know Jesus right after me. And I came to Dwight and I said, you need to, you need to help this student know Jesus. And he looked at me, somebody who didn't know the Bible, and said, no, no, no. I think you need to meet with Rod. Wait a minute. I don't know the Bible. I don't have everything together. I'm still figuring out the Jesus thing. He said, just read the Bible together. And the journey from that day forward continued on for me. It's life after life after life. I will stand up before you and say, my name is just Mick, who loves Jesus. And I have never aspired to be any title, or any position, or any responsibility. The only thing, all those things happened because of July 28th, 1982, 40 years and a couple weeks from now changed everything for me. And here I stand before you as a middle-aged white dude that is more passionate about Jesus today than I was in that moment. So I'm going to call you to something that he called me to, that in a moment you more than just say, I want to be a laborer, but you actually put it into practice and say, who is that name? Who is the individual that I must meet with right now? And I don't have all the answers. This is not just to you students. This is to adults, because here's what I know about most adults, even pastors. You're involved with everything else, but you don't even have people you're meeting with week in and week out. We do everything else but relationships. The reason why I know that, because I'm guilty as charged. Anybody else in the room? I've had my moments. But I am currently meeting with a guy named Giscar from Congo and Wilford from South Africa who attend our church, and Damar, who just came to know Jesus six months ago, and Roger, who's depressed and alone, and uh, James, whose wife had an affair on him. And we're just getting together and reading the Bible together every week and writing about what Jesus is doing in our lives. What am I doing? I'm seeing them. I'm valuing them. I can't fix them. I just point them to him. And I've been doing that all the days of my life. Now, let me just tell you quickly. I wish I could tell you in 40 years of that, that all of those individuals I've done multiplied and did it. If they had, as Charlie showed us last night, I would have, we would have met over a million plus people. But that's not the case. Here's what I know to be true, and it stinks. The vast majority of the people I've met with didn't keep on keeping on. When my wife and I served in the Islamic world, the Muslims who we love dearly said to us at the end of our time, thank you for coming here. We're more devout Muslims as a result of your witness. 
And Jesus reminded us in Matthew 16, 18, and I will build my church, not me. That's, not, that's above my pay grade. All I'm to do is to love you. Whether you want Jesus or not, I love you. But I stand before you today in the, on the back nine of my life. I still have to go to 100 because I'm living to 100, running the 100-meter dash, and then I'm going to Jesus. But I'm on the back nine. And I'm reminded of Tahir, who I led to Jesus in the Islamic nation, and Shamil, who are now dancing with Jesus, who never heard of him before. And two teammates, three teammates who served with me in the Middle East. Todd, who's now dancing with Jesus. Larry, who's now dancing Jesus, who is a medical doctor. And Steve, who was a young adult age, who died in my country as a 28, 29-year-old because of situations I can't explain at this moment. But it was all worth it. And serving in Detroit... And Leroy's dancing with Jesus today. Carlos, who lived in our house, is dancing with Jesus today. Lamont, who I shared many hours with, is dancing with Jesus today. Why do I share that with you? Because there's an urgency about what we're saying. The whole week is this is real. And this is life and death. And the question is, are we on the main thing? As loving God and loving people. I'm telling you right now, this may sound a little strange because it may sound contradictory to what we just said all week. It's much easier to share Jesus with somebody beside you on the airplane and much easier to say a prayer over somebody and receive the Holy Spirit than it is to do life with somebody day in and day out in their messiness. Those are one and done. It's not that they're bad. But the true impact is getting in the messiness of lives with other people. And if you think you've got to have a college degree and have the Bible all together and have your, all, your life all together, you've missed the whole point. It's the journey that we are on, and he's called us to. I'm still on it. You're still on it. Whatever your story is, we need people to rise up and say, hear me. Let my life count. So this is how we're concluding today. You say, are you willing to do that? I'm simply calling you to ask, you got your pen? The most important thing you're going to write the entire week is the following. God, whose name am I to go engage and ask to start meeting together with once a week, hopefully? Who is that person? Who is it? Maybe it's more than one. Who is that individual? And there's not a one of us that's off the hook. Every single one of us. Who is that individual? And you may be sitting here saying, wait a minute. I don't know who. God hasn't given that to me. I'd say simply start praying about it. I lived in the Middle East, and I wanted to meet somebody that could encourage me, another Christian, when there was only um, five known Christians in the country, and I needed encouragement. And if God found somebody that could encourage me in the Middle East, I'm pretty positive he can find somebody around you that you can be meeting with. Does this make sense? And the last thing I would say to you tonight, and when you meet, we got a lot of tools. They gave you a video. They got an app. They've got a whole multiplication movement. You got a book in your hand. You got a, if you don't have the money, you got it simple as a journal. We got Dwight's classic spiritual life notebook. But most importantly, all you need is your Bible. It's all you really need at the end of the day. God wants your life to count tonight. And are you willing to go there? The last thing I would say is, be you. Simply be you. Don't be anybody else. Be you. You don't have to have all the answers. You just need to be somebody that loves God and comes alongside other people. Here's what you need to know. If we're going to change the world, we're going to do it the way Dwight just preached it. Let me say this to you students. I said to my daughter, who's 26 years old and is now a pastor, uh, ordained minister. I said to her, and I pointed to her as we were talking, and I said, Michaela, 
you are going to change the world, number one, and you are going to lead the greatest church in the history of our country. It's going to look different than the church today. It may be smaller than the church today, but there's going to be no more middle ground. The people you will lead will be sold out for Jesus and hearts ablaze for him. There will be no more middle ground. Adrian talked, he, he said the verse twice, but he was talking so fast he went right by it, and some of you didn't catch it. 2 Timothy 3.12, if you live a godly life, you will be persecuted. And you know what I said to my daughter, who's just a few years ahead of you? Choose this day who you're going to serve. Because if you want to be popular and you want to be accepted in the world in which we live today, you will not be able to follow Jesus. It's, the line is being drawn as we speak. And the only way we will have an impact is not by some fancy sermon or some fancy band or some fancy church building. The only way we're going to change the world is life on life, of valuing people and engaging people who think differently than you and loving them in spite of those differences. So I stand here at this season of my life and willing to cheer you on. And, and, I, and by the way, I'm going to be side by side with you. That we are going to finish this thing. And it's not going to be easy. But that's the way the church started. I'm convinced that's the way the church is going to end. So we are telling you it's not going to be easy. When Jesus said, follow me, I'm here to tell you it will cost you something. I don't have time to tell you all of the scars that I have in my life. But it's been worth every scar that I have. And I know that you can experience the exact same thing. So here's what I'd like for you to do. I'd like for you to bow your heads with me. And I want to pray for you. And then Dwight's going to come back, and we're going to do something way different. We're going to actually commission you, but not in a traditional sense where we come up in the front and have a big prayer time. We're actually going to do that in our small groups. And we're actually going to anoint you with oil. It's going to be pretty powerful to commission you to go. And as again, I'd say to you, if you don't feel like you know how to do it, connect with us at Forge. We truly want to help you figure that out. But with every head bowed and every eye closed as I pray, how many of you, after being here a week and listening to all these sermons, are at this point to say, you know what? Enough is enough. It's not about all that Jesus can do for me. It's about how I can serve him. I believe that the Holy Spirit is our only hope. I don't care how motivated you are without the Holy Spirit, you simply will not be able to do what Dwight just said. Your heart is too selfish as mine is. He will not only change our heart, he will give us the ability to do what we need to do. So I want to pray for you, but in my church, we like to pray in freedom. So what I mean by that is, as I pray for you, that means you can stay seated. It means you can stand. It means you can kneel. It means you can raise your hands. It means you can sit just as you are. Some of your traditions, you know, just do whatever your tradition is. But what I want to do is I want to pray for those names that God has given you. But I also want to pray that the infilling and the power of the Holy Spirit on you. Is that okay? Anybody afraid of the Holy Spirit tonight? He's faithful. He's a faithful one. And I guess the heaviness that I had just a few minutes ago, he wants to take that pain away from you so that you can be truly a laborer and stop listening to those lies. Is there anybody here today that by standing up would say, yes, I want, I have the Holy Spirit in my life, but I want him to control my life. I want him to fill me from my head to his to my toe, my heart, my mind, my hands, my attitude. I'm going to invite you to stand if that is you tonight. You want that feeling right now. I want the feeling of the Holy Spirit that he could control me every moment of my, of my day. So 
Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Go ahead right now. I'm leading you now. You can pray privately. You can pray out loud. Just say in the name of Jesus. Go ahead. Start asking that he would now fill you. Go ahead, church. Go ahead and call it out. Fill me, Holy Spirit. Take my mind. Take my heart. Take my body. Take my fears. Take my hurt. Give me the mind of Christ. Erase all of those horrific tapes and all of those horrific uh, lies that continue to hold me down and make me free tonight to be your woman, to be your man. Help me to truly forgive me. Somebody in the room tonight needs to forgive themselves because Christ has already forgiven you. In the name of Jesus, receive that truth. You are free. You are a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The old is gone and the new has begun. You are free. Allow that to be a part of you tonight. There's somebody here tonight that is fearful. God did not give you a spirit of fear, but he gave you a spirit of courage and of love and self-discipline and a sound mind. Receive that truth today. Some of you tonight are standing here and thinking, well, my schedule is too big. Uh, my, 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 my responsibilities are too overwhelming. And to today I pray in Jesus' name that you be freed, that you, God would allow you to be the main thing, the main thing in Jesus' name. Now, Holy Spirit, fill us. Go ahead and just ask. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Fill us completely. We are not afraid of you. Less of us, more of you. Less of us, more of you. Truly enable us to be your men and women today. With us, it is impossible. With you, all things are possible. I am weak, but you are strong. I am a conqueror. Somebody say conqueror tonight. Somebody say conqueror tonight. Say, I'm a victor in Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on the author and the perfecter of your faith tonight. And I believe this in Jesus' name. I believe this in Jesus' name. Amen. Look up this way. Here's the last word that the Lord just wanted me to say. And some of you is for you. Holly, stand up. Miosha, stand up. Miosha's right there. Holly's right there. And the reason why the Holy Spirit just brought both of you to mind, because I had conversations with both of you this week about being a multiplier. But both of you, I talked about it, doing it differently than the traditional sense of doing it, that it has to be in the four walls of your church. To do it at your restaurant, your Cinnabon place, and allowing God to give you names and your husband Jason's name, that you will reach people that nobody will ever reach. And he's saying, go out and be that. And we now value that as high as any other call in the church of Jesus Christ. And Miosha, we talked today. You don't fit into any of those boxes, right? God has uniquely gifted you. And he's saying to you, my daughter, I want you to be my hands and feet to a world that desperately needs me. And that is a call high from God to be a multiplier and to meet them. And as Dwight just preached, see them, value them, love them, and point them to Jesus. The reason why I just gave these two ladies before you is because there's probably 10 or 20 more of you in this room that your life is to count today. And that's what we mean by laborer. If not now, when? And if not us, who? I say now. I say us. My prayer is that you would say that too. Amen.